production. And they're concerned with the integration of new technologies into old forms of music, so instrumental music and many other things like that. Um, tonight we're going to be hearing uh, the ensemble triocular. How would you say that in French? Triocular. Ah, that's what I meant. <laughs> ensemble triocular. <laughs> and they're going to be, um, and are all of them from Canada? No, uh, we have uh, Charlotte Hogg is from Zurich. And Zurich. she's the voice in viola. That's right. Francois Hamou. He's from Vancouver. Famous clarinet player. Is right there. And Charlotte is there. Oh, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. I do a row of fans there, so don't <laughs> fail. <laughs> and Lori Kramer is here somewhere? Yeah. Hi, Lori. Hi. Lori is from Montreal. Grace clarinet and contrabass tonight also? Yes. Oh, terrific. Um, and Guillaume Barrett is in the Guillaume Barrett is in, he's out there, the young looking man. Oh, there you are. Absolutely okay. brilliant. He's also a composer and he's also a programmer. He's created an app and uh, he's a marvelous tech director. And then are you performing with the ensemble as well? Yes, I'm processing the visuals. But, um, but the one thing that's important is that these musicians uh, are creating all the sounds. I'm not processing their sounds. Right. I'm only processing the images. We'll get to that in a moment. Let me yeah. introduce our other guest. Yes, uh, please. Uh, on the far end is Morton Svotnik. Uh, welcome, Mort. Good to have you here. <laughs> and with him is his collaborator of the past 15 years, Lilibet. Five festivals in five climate regions of Colombia to teach people why it's important not to cut down trees. 
Jesus in their own image. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. And you do that through uh, sensitivity to sound, which I think is very interesting. Yeah. Um, do I detect an Irish accent? You may, because um, I grew up in Ireland. Yeah, you did. Okay. You, but you were born in Stockholm. I was born in Sweden. We lived there for one year. My father was a journalist. We moved around eight countries in eight years. Eight countries? And at the age of eight, I couldn't speak any language. <laughs> <laughs> so we settled in Ireland. I had an Irish passport, an Irish accent, but no Irish accent. My mother was Ukrainian, my father was French, Scottish. Very interesting. And Lilliman, what does that mean? It means little friend in Swedish, and it's my real name, but as any Swedes here will attest to, it's not a normal name in Sweden. My parents fought for this name, but I go to Sweden, and they laugh at me. <laughs> do you have a surname? I do, but it's Popjoy. Popjoy. Popjoy, which is a French Huguenot name originally, but always got misspelled in reviews as Popjoy, as if it was my artist name, the joy of pop. <laughs> I've been in San Francisco, but a review where they said, you would think somebody who can make this wonderful imagery would have more imagination when it comes to coming up with an artist. <laughs> 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 that's, that's not even my name, it's misspelled. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Well, nobody misspells Subotnik, right? No, nobody. <laughs> except when that was called Surbotnik. <laughs> 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 oh, that's amazing. Um, Mark, we're going to be listening to you playing what sounds like a Buchla synthesizer, but there's no Buchla synthesizer there. First of all, did you have a role in designing what Don Buchla made when he made this terrific uh, No, I commissioned it. You didn't design it. He, I, he designed it with I, your I, guidance? So. I gave him instructions on what it was to be, and we worked together, I guess, once or twice a week for the better part of a year on paper. Um, he all the time wanted to make a musical instrument, and I wanted to make a, a, um, um, an analog computer for mu- making music. I wanted to, I was trying to make a new music, and I didn't want to bring old instruments in. So the only argument we ever had is that he wanted a musical instrument, and I said, no musical instrument, no keyboard, no this, no that, and uh, yes, I helped design it. I gave him the, I gave him what the, the needs were to uh, what I what I needed, and and uh, he didn't help me learn what a transistor was or anything. I had to go to the uh, um, the Navy book on uh, electronics, and then I realized. I didn't know about anything about electricity, so I had to go to the Navy book. I I think that I kept aspirin in, in probably, they made it as a result. I was taking aspirin all night long for weeks and weeks as I tried to figure all this stuff out to be able to talk to him. He didn't give, he smirked a little bit. <laughs> so that was struggling with all the technology works, but he, he did all the, you know, he, he, he made it. How many people here have played a Buchla synthesizer? Wow, that's quite a few. What is the importance of the Buchla synthesizer? What did it do that previous? Well, there wasn't a previous synthesizer. (laughs) That was it, that was the first one. Uh, But it wasn't a synthesizer. And um, the Moog came, um, Moog had made modules. I mean, there were modules around, but nobody had made a full-blown instrument. no, I'm using the word. But, um, I almost used it. it you know, it's hard not to use the, the word, but um, um, the, um, the Mo, I knew, I knew Robert. Um, Mo, um, we, I think in those days, this, this, we're talking 1958, 59, 60, 61, and that general period. I think the world of electronics at that point in music was roughly about 27 people worldwide. <laughs> I mean, it was just, there was no, no as far as I know, um, there was a studio in Israel, there was, um, you know, but it was mostly tape, with tape recorders and, and high, very costly um, oscillators. They were $300 in those days, but that was equivalent to several thousand dollars. I'd like to invite everybody to come on in. Yeah. Sit down and take any seat, whether it's Mark or not. 
So, uh, so actually, um, we started here in San Francisco. Uh, the, it was the second year of the Tape Center, so it would have been around 1961-62. I realized I didn't have any knowledge whatsoever that would lead to making anything that would sound decent. So I put an ad in the, um, um, when we got to the Visitero Street, I put an ad in the paper. Uh, I've never done that before or since, but um, um, saying I needed an engineer to do this thing. And the first guy came in and we discovered there were drugs in San Francisco. <laughs> and um, the second guy came in and we were sure they were drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then Don Bukla came in, who never talked, he didn't talk very much. Um, and I thought he was, a, he, he, told, he told me who he was, Ramon Sender and myself were there. And um, I thought he was answering the ad in the paper. He was actually <laughs> wanting to borrow a tape recorder. But um, I didn't find that out for three or four years. <laughs> I told him what I was looking for and he said, I can do that. What did the synthesizer let you do that you couldn't? Pardon? What did the synthesizer let you do? Oh, well, it wasn't a synthesizer. But what it, what it was designed to do was to, uh, I was convinced that the computer was going to take over the whole thing at that point. But it, it, you couldn't do it in real time. It, it would take you a week. If I said, record me now, um, Five days later, you would get the first word, you should. I mean, it, it was so slow, there was, there was no, I thought it was gonna take 10 years, it actually took 20 years to get to the point where you could actually do anything with it. So I, I was convinced that a musical instrument, I'll, I'll give you an example. 45 million, they found a flute in, in Austria that was 45,000 years old. And its tuning was the pentatonic scale, which still today is the, is the major scale, the most, not the major scale, <laughs> the most used scale of all human beings on the, on the earth, 45,000 years of the pentatonic scale. And it had to, it was a beautiful flute, so it had to be 10 or 15,000 years before that, that it had developed. And sure enough, just recently they found a, a flute in a cave, um, 55,000 years old. And it wasn't made by humans, it was made by the Neanderthals. So we may have gotten music from the Neanderthals as we were beating them up. Um, but, but, this the, the idea of a musical instrument once you get it you can't get rid of it because it makes all the music and all the music you, you see you can play anything you want on the piano well you can hit it with a hammer or you can do various things but you, you still have a tuned instrument you can't play anything you want or how you want to play it so i was concerned i was convinced that the new technology which was just about to blossom was a, a moment in history similar, it would be to music what the printing press was the language. It meant a complete shift in, in, what it, in, in what you could possibly do. And so I was looking for a way to make new, a new, new music, and you can't make a new, new music if you use an old instrument, because it's gonna be a new, old music. So um, the idea was to completely be able to start from scratch and and just make every person could have his or her own music. And so you didn't want to have anything related to the past. You were kind I of. I didn't want to have anything related to the past. But you uh, were an instrumentalist playing in orchestras. Yes, and the, the minute I could give it up, I gave it up. <laughs> because this, well, not because I didn't like doing it, but because I would not be able to make a new new music while I played the clarinet. And once I got it going, I took it out of my biography even. Um, it, it, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. The, um, um, with the clarinet, 
I could make a living. With no question, I'm, I was playing with the San Francisco Symphony and doing concertos and the whole thing. Um, it would have been, it's impossible. I know now because it's been a lot of years since I've been at it. There is no such thing as knowing what a new, new music is. You can't do it. It's, it's very, very difficult. You can come close, but, but it's just not possible to, to imagine it. Imagine that with being able to play the clarinet. Uh, I would never have gotten, I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have been able to do it. I took it out of my biography and nobody up until recently, I put it back in recently, but up until recently, there, most people don't even know I played the clarinet still at this point. And when I moved to New York, we were moving to New York, we were going in a Volkswagen bus to New York. I went to the post office and got all the books sent so they would be there when we got there. And I took my clarinet case and I handed it to them and I said, this I would like to go through the Suez Canal and if it sinks, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> when the Tate Music Center was located at 321 Visadero, there was an upstairs control right. room where you could broadcast from because radio station KPFA put in 15 kill cycle phone lines and right. you could broadcast. Who was the announcer for this? Pardon? Who was the announcer for your broadcast? We didn't have broadcasts. KPFA actually broadcast. But I thought the Tate Music Center was doing concerts. We did concerts, but I don't know. Who, I don't think they broadcast our concerts. Okay, so they were. They were, were just making. In. I got it. And they they fixed the whole place up. We had the upstairs, um, and they paid rent, and Halpern the company paid rent, and we 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 didn't have to pay anything. But you did collaborate with Anna Halpern in making music for their performances? No, Anne Halpern. Yeah. You know, that, that, they had, there were two auditoriums, and um, KPFA had the auditorium, and Anne Halpern had a space that was as big as an auditorium. And she, you know, that was her San Francisco place. I was, I was her, their um, composer. Um, and um, and it, it, anyway, that's it. <laughs> The um, uh, music, Linda, that you're doing on tonight's concert is um, all in a, a series called Live Structures, right? Why do you call it Live Structures? Oh, excuse me, I, I have to interrupt. You asked a question, we never got the answer to it. The, the, uh, then, then I'll give up on oh, this. That it's important because there is um, the Bukla, I have, 27 oscillator, book oscillators in my computer. I copy and paste. Um, 27 oscillators would cover that easily, the whole table over there would. And I have everything else in the book is, 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 is uh, designed. Um, it, it would, I would have a whole stage full of equipment if I so it's all in the laptop. It's all in the book book. And that's why I did this other thing, because that's what I was after. And it's only in the last two or three years that the computer's been fast enough to, at home, to be able to do this. So that, what you're going to see is, in here is Bukla, a Bukla synthesizer that you, that if we had it in this room, you wouldn't see us. It would be covering the whole front of the stage. And that was the whole idea of it. Well, it's nice miniaturization. Sure, sure. No, 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 this is good. <laughs> you know, I, I want to say something to, uh, I want to address something that Maurice Button mentioned, where there you were playing in an orchestra, you knew the repertoire, you were obviously a very good musician, and yet this was not the music you were hearing in your head. This was not the music you wanted to do. You needed some tool to have more variety of pitch systems. Is that what you were saying earlier? No, not exactly. Um, I would have been happy to keep doing the clarinet. Um, it was easy for me to do. Um, but and it, it was so easy that I had to give it up. I just felt I was at a moment in time. And uh, in order to know that moment, nobody, very few people actually went in that direction. In fact, 
just about nobody, as it turns out. And um, I felt, since I knew this, I could be wrong. I mean, I, I turned out I wasn't wrong, but uh, I could be wrong. But it was my duty as a human being to do something. I didn't want to, 20 years later, say, oh, I could have done that if I'd only done such and such. I wanted, it was something I needed to do, and I had to give up the clarinet in order to be able to do it. That was really what was going on. Well, that's just so interesting because for me, um, I, you know, I, I loved uh, contemporary music. I discovered basically Mozart, Beethoven, and Baez at the same time, because I was kind of an autodidact. And um, so new music was just a revelation for me. And uh, when I went to school, I, I, I had to study, of course, electronic music. That's in the 70s, mid 70s. And I was having a really hard time because I felt like the electronic music was somewhat rudimentary. And I was wondering, how can I use the traditional instruments and make them do the sounds that I want. And until this electronic music evolved enough that I feel like I, I want to use it. And uh, so it's like I reacted in a completely different way to the electronic music. Like you were building something while I said, ah, I'll wait for people to build something I like and then I'll be using it. Which is basically what I did. I worked with the traditional instrument, acoustic instruments for 20 years without even amplification. And then in 2000, I said, okay, there's some interesting things happening. And then I started to study electronic music, but still to this day, um, I'm fascinated by the range. Also, you know, I think the technique, the extended techniques and the techniques that new improvisers have uh, developed has extended the language to such a way that when we play with this ensemble, people often think that I'm processing their sound. And I'm not. This is all their sound. Um, and when, it, when it's a recorded tape, you will definitely understand that this is pre-recorded because they're tempo balls. But um, the rest of the time, it's their sound. I'm only processing images from their sounds. And yet, uh, many people have come to me and said, I'm sh I was sure you were doing something electronic, you know? So what are we going to see while these sounds are being played on the instrument? What we're going to see is, uh, and you asked me the question about life structure, the reason why I call them life structures is because they are compositions in the sense that they have a structure. But the structure is very alive with the musicians playing it. So in, one of, a good image that we have is that it, I, I give them, uh, they're sitting in a car and there's a GPS and I'm, the GPS is telling them to turn left and right and go up the hill and down the hill, but they are creating the landscape. So I'm not telling them what to play, the color to play, the textures to play, I'm not telling them any of this, but I am telling them, I'm giving them instructions and the instructions are being interactive. So to answer your questions with no further detour, um, the technology that uh, I've developed with uh, Joseph Brown, and it's funny that because Morton, felt, uh, Morton Sputnik was mentioning how he was arguing with uh, what you wanted to do, and he was saying, I don't want to do this. And I had the similar, the similar work with the person I was working with, uh, developing the tool for this graphical notation where I was saying, I want to do this, I don't want to do this, and why are we doing this? So it's interesting how this interaction with technology, when you work with a, to somebody that's very good with technology, but you have some kind of idea musically of what you want to do. So life structures, tool, ocular score. I wanted to develop a graphical notation that would represent the sounds of musicians that improvise with, with textures and timbers. Um, and uh, the way we do this is we, we, the, 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 the computer is analyzing their sounds in real life and in real time. And through the tool, I'm able to create images interpreting uh, the data from the analysis of their sound. So it's done in real time. But what is the impetus for the first sound? It depends because each piece, each structure, each life structure is a different paradigm. For example, in the first piece, we're inspired by birds, murmuration, murmur. 
So um, any one of them can start. What happens is that uh, they play each other's score. So it's like a game of telephone. Somebody makes a sound and then a shape goes on the screen. Immediately. Oh. And then they, it, they interpret that sound and then the other person sees, because they don't see it's behind them, they see what they've created. But of course, like a game of telephone, there's a person in between, right? So that person in between is me with the tool and I can shape I can interpret the visual, this, image. the visual image. For example, they could be playing uh, very, for example, anyway, trying not to go into the weeds, but I can manipulate in such a way that I'm influencing how the shape is gonna be and how the person will continue playing. What if somebody plays a very loud sound and you see a very wide image? And then you might, but, but you, you might can... also see a tiny image because I've decided to do that. You, you screwed it up. <laughs> I'm controlling amplitudes, I'm controlling the, the, we've realized that a large image is often interpreted like, like something that's loud, and a smaller image, something that's uh, less loud, softer. So I can change the amplitude, the, the volume, by reducing the amplitude scale, and suddenly the image that's gonna be projected to the second player will be small. I can also change the frequency range. You might be doing but I reduce the frequency range, it's gonna be like So suddenly, even though they imitate one another, there is a set of presets and directions that I've put into the computer in advance, and that's the structure, that's the life structure. And Lilliban, what is the relationship of your visual images to what Mort Sabotnik is doing with his music? Um, Are you independent entirely? Yes. It's probably important to know for tonight's performance for people to see what we're doing. There's no technical connection between us at all. There's no media cables. There's nothing to trigger. Are you responding to him? We're responding to each other. Oh. We should also know that there's a screen on stage so you can see the video. And we respond to dialogue. We sometimes say it's a bit like jazz people work together, even though we do doesn't look or sound anything like jazz, I guess. But that kind of format. We listen, we watch, and it's a dialogue. But um, if Mark makes a sound that's very, uh, has a very strong entrance, what do you do? I might go with it, or I might go against it. Mm -hmm. I think what you're also saying, you said at the beginning, um, I'm accompanying music, and in some way I understand why you say that, and people see it like that. Actually, I would say we're performing together. I go further and say we're composing together. What we're doing on stage every time we perform, I say that that one can correct me if he says it differently, but we're composing together at that moment, and there happen to be people here watching and listening. So we would be doing something similar in the studio, it's not a presentation of the work that we've come up with before. If he's doing something very quiet, how do you keep from overwhelming the audience so that they're distracted and they don't listen to the quiet sounds? How do they distract your audience? How, 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 how do you prevent that? Oh, we see, it's, it's very intuitive. I mean, sometimes I go with him and I can feel where he's going. We have, a, as you were saying, you have your dramaturgy, your, your presets. We have a rough dramaturgy and we know what we're going to get to in these 45 minutes. But sometimes I go with him or sometimes I decide, oh, today I go completely against and see if he goes with me. Or we diverge, it's also nice to have some pitfalls and see how do we get out of this. Mm -hmm. Like where we now in the middle of the box, how do we get out of this? Ah, oh, I made it, or I didn't, I've got to go further. That's what keeps it interesting for us as well, hopefully also for the audience. The, tonight's program is uh, the printed program booklet is has a change. Uh, we've added one piece of wind is called pandemonium and be in this, this second position. So this insert will show you that the order is murmuration, pandemonium, and gathering. And uh, is there a particular reason you call the middle movement pandemonium? Um. No, well, actually, the, 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 the idea of pandemonium is that um, the, the musicians get very close to creating a pandemonium that we don't. So, on frôle. It's like uh, the idea that, you know, the idea that chaos is actually destructive. It, it's not necessarily destructive. In chaos, there is a certain order that happens very quickly when people listen and when people are sensitive to one another. So the energy can be building with certain presets that are there uh, in a certain order, and then suddenly it changes. So it's playing with an idea that chaos is actually 
organizes itself, the same way that birds are organized in their flight, even though they change directions all the time, and it's taken a very long time to figure out how they do that. Do you remember hearing Silver Apples of the Moon in the late 60s when it came out on a record? I lived in Montreal and I didn't speak English then. <laughs> um, how many people bought Silver Apples of the Moon on an LP? Wow, that's a lot of people. What did you think when you got that LP? This is pretty amazing. You wanted more. You wanted more. Well, then they got the wild bull after that and a whole bunch of others. Um, more the, uh, the biographies always, always mention silver apples of the moon. You're the composer, but it's like Ravel and Bolero. It, do you sometimes wish that people would talk about your other pieces as well? Um, no, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, get, they get mentioned. Silver Apples was, was a, a real breakthrough. It, it surprised everyone. I, I, if I have a moment, I'll tell you how it happened. I was, I had already told you I was after this new, new music and I was in my studio in New York on Blaker Street where all the rock bands were playing and, and I worked all night. Um, and, um, and, People from the rock bands would come in and just sit. There was a the, there was a saying I can't remember what it was that, that they called. They, they were they were passed the word on after you're done at two o'clock in the morning. Go over across the street to book to uh, Morton Subotnik's studio. There were no locks on the doors, so you know you just could walk in. And people walked in at an old sofa there, and they just sat and um, and did early. Um, you know, intellectual conversations that went something like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever introduced themselves to me, and they just sat, and, um, and I was giving lectures, and, um, um, and about the new, new music, and to symphony societies, and <laughs> so forth. And the, new, the the concept of the new new music that I was talking about, and um, um, I said the this, this was the time of um, um, Marshall McLuhan. He, was, he had the first book hadn't come out yet, but it was already coming um, in, into the world. I, I guess it had come out by then, uh, and um, and um, so I was. I wondered what the message of the medium was, of this thing that I was doing, and I decided it was the record player uh, was the medium. And so I'd give lectures that it would, uh, for a piece of music that was intended to be played in front of an audience, and that's, by the way, where the, the, the visual part comes in, because you see the person playing, and that causes you, to, it's a different part of your, Sen sensory perception, and that causes you to hear it differently. And so that's why I began using visuals, so that the visual artist is interpreting and m moving in a different way, that I'm, and it affects a different part of the brain. And because I'm just sitting there doing things, you can't even see what I'm doing. So um, that, that was a, a backlog. Anyway, one, one evening, at about two o'clock in the morning, at the same time that people came in, this man comes in, and he's wearing jeans, Levi's, like the rest of us were doing, except his were pleated. And um, he looked a little odd to me for that reason. And he, he gave me my speech. He said, I'm the president of this record company, and the message of the medium is electronic music, and we'd like you to be the first to do this thing. And I, not very nicely told him to leave. <laughs> he offered me $500. They, they, they decided they'd give me 500 and I asked him to please leave. And so um, I approached him, um, but I didn't, I wasn't gonna hit him or anything, but he said, okay, okay, I'm going. So he 
he leaves. The next morning I came up, my daughter is here, uh, I, I got in before they got up in the morning and listened to a Brandenburg concerto and then to get them off to school. And um, that was I your record, at them. Yeah. That was your record? The Brandenburg concerto? Oh, yeah. Oh. And, uh, um, and you looked at the uh, label, what did it say? The record company was none such. <laughs> and, I, and I looked and, I, and he said the record company was none such. And I couldn't find the phone number and I thought, for Christ's sake, I spent all this time, I have an opportunity to do this thing, and I blew it. So the next night, at 2 o'clock in the morning, he comes in again. And he immediately raises his hands and he said, don't touch me. Just listen to me. He said, We're, we, I was going to get down on my hands and knees and say, I'll do it for nothing. And he said, we, we, We've met and we're going to offer you $1,000. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of Silver Apple Blue the Moon. That's um, and I think it was Richard. Um, is he here? Yeah, Richard Friedman. Yeah. yeah, raise your hand. Uh, I was going to call up with my two kids. Um, their names backwards, uh, and he called it a journey of these two kids. But Richard had a better idea with um, the um, silver apple of the moon from Yeats. Golden, yeah, from Yeats. And, um, and the nice thing about that poem was that he's actually looking for, um, he's looking for a woman, a particular woman, I think it is. Um, is that right, Richard? Something like that. Anyway, it was like I was looking for something and, and I, I picked the right title. So it was Silver Apple from the Moon. And um, and I didn't see him for over 50 years. I, ne I never saw him again. The, the, it, it was a major production that came out and it was, um, uh, I was <laughs> getting my kids to school, but I was also Vogue's Magazine uh, bachelor of the Month. <laughs> and, 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 I, I, I had to turn down um, the, the Johnny Carson show twice. It, it was just it was just nuts. I couldn't believe what was going on. But, well, thanks to Jack Holtzman for staying yeah. with it and making that a reality. I'd like to thank our panelists, but before we conclude, I, I do want to mention that um, the order tonight is reversed. Morton Svotnik will go first, and uh, well, he's got all his energy, and <laughs> and uh, and Linda Bouchard will go second. And s the other thing I want to mention is that you have a survey form in your printed program. If you fill it out and put it in the Dropbox during our 15-minute break before the concert starts, we're going to be giving away some very nice uh, prizes to the winners of a drawing, and the um, prizes include. Morton Subotnik signed book of Jim Newman's The Lexi Gallery uh, publication. It is a 500-page uh, book about the history of the gallery that uh, Jim Newman, who co-founded Other Minds, and who's not here tonight, his wheelchair broke. And <laughs> he has an electric wheelchair at the power plant. Oh, God. So he'll be here tomorrow. But uh, Jim Newman's gallery was from 1959 to 1970, one of the major places in the West Coast where you could see experimental visual art hanging on the wall. And um, the extensive history in that book documents a lot of West Coast painters um, that are now very famous, including Lane Wiley and others. That book is uh, newly published, and on the back of it is a score of Mort's. And so Mort has signed the book, and that's one of the prizes. The others will be the Other Minds t-shirt and a new CD by Tom Bickley. Is, are you here, Tom? No. Uh, he is a person who works with ambient sounds and instrumental sounds. It, it just got a great review this morning on the Bandcamp website, and it's an extremely beautiful record called um, Jefferson Prairie. So those are the prizes. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thanks to our panelists for a lovely uh, <laughs>